Welcome to Korean True Crime with me, your host, Mimi Muziko. In today's episode, we will be discussing the Sewol Ferry tragedy, its connections to cults, and the references made in the Netflix series All of Us Are Dead. We're going. What was that? We're going back to the year 2014, and we're taking a ride on the Sewol Ferry. Its name translates to Beyond the World, but this passenger ferry traveled between Incheon and Jeju Island. The Sewol Ferry was quite a large ship. It could carry around 920 passengers, 180 vehicles, and 150 cargo containers. Our incident occurs on April 16th, 2014, with 476 passengers aboard the ferry between Jeju Island and Incheon. 325 of them are high school students returning from a trip to Jeju. The Sewol Ferry could make the trip between Incheon and Jeju Island about three times a week safely. To go between the islands, they had to pass through a channel of rough waters. This day, the waters were relatively calm, but just to be safe, the helmsman and third mate took over the controls and manually steered the ship through the channel. The ferry entered the channel at about 8.30 a.m., skies were clear, and the waters were calm. At 8.48 a.m., the helmsman noticed that the ship was beginning to lean to the left, and to correct this, they decided to begin turning the ship to the right, hoping to bring the ship back to center. After multiple right turns, they noticed that it wasn't correcting, so they began to figure out a plan for how to bring the ship back to center. The helmsman remarked that the steering wheel wasn't properly working when they noticed that the ferry was beginning to capsize. To correct the right-hand turns they had made previously, they began to make extremely sharp left-hand turns, jolting both passengers and crew members. The helmsman and third mate began to panic, which led to miscommunications that were dire for their situation. The third mate instructed that they take another sharp turn left, but the helmsman misunderstood and took a sharp turn right, sealing the fate of the capsizing ferry. Four minutes later, at 8.52 a.m., the Sewol began to sink. The captain was informed and made a brief announcement to the passengers that chills my bones to this day, knowing what the fate of most of the passengers was. Please don't move, stay put, hold on to available pillars, and stand by. This is crazy. Is this the kind of situation where they tell you, stay put, it'll be okay? And then they run away for their lives? At that same time, 8.52 a.m., an emergency call was made, but not by the captain, by one of the high school students aboard. This would be the first call to emergency services received that day. Cho duk ha called emergency services, and because of his brave decision, emergency services were alerted as soon as possible. Seven minutes after the Sewol ferry began to capsize at 8.55 a.m., the Sewol crew finally made a call to the Jeju Vessel Traffic Services, which is not an emergency service number, vaguely, but said they wanted the Coast Guard to come assess their situation. At 8.58 a.m., the Coast Guard sent out one patrol vessel to survey the area and rescue passengers. Please note that this patrol vessel holds about 60 people, and that's including the crew that's already on it. At 9.03 a.m., 15 minutes after the ship has begun to capsize, passengers are still being told to stay in their rooms, don't move, and no one is being asked to move towards exits or to swim away from the boat if they can. At 9.06 a.m., the vessel traffic services calls nearby ships to confirm visually that the ship is indeed capsizing. Instead of sending rescue boats to save them, they've now wasted almost 20 minutes. By 9.14 a.m., the crew aboard the ferry reports that the angle of the ferry made evacuation almost impossible for most of the passengers aboard. 
but the passengers are still being told to stay put. At 9.23 a.m., 35 minutes since the ship began to capsize, the VTS informs the captain that he needs to tell the passengers to put on life vests. It has taken this long to get crucial information to the passengers aboard the sinking ferry. 9.30 a.m., the captain orders all of his crew to evacuate. However, this is never announced to the passengers who are still waiting in their rooms on the ship. At 9.33 a.m., civilians on boats began to flock to the ship and offer their services to help rescue passengers on the ship. The Coast Guard has still not yet sent rescue boats. At 9.46 a.m., Captain Lee was one of the first people saved from the sinking ferry. Thanks to the efforts of the civilians who showed up at the scene, some students and passengers were saved from the sinking ship. But by 11.18 a.m., the ship was fully submerged, the bow showing just barely above the water. By 1.03 p.m., the ship was completely submerged. I mean it when I say this incident is one of the most heartbreaking moments in Korean history because people had to watch their loved ones slowly sink into the ocean on live television, witnessing no rescue boats arrive. Let's discuss some of the details that were happening while the ship was capsizing. During the sinking, some of the crew members and the captain were seen drinking beer while hanging over the railing of the ship while announcements were being made for passengers to stay inside their cabins. Passengers inside the ship recorded videos or called their loved ones while the ferry was sinking, and a lot of that footage has been recovered. A lot of the students initially believed that the situation wasn't dire and that it wasn't really an emergency, but simply something that they would tell their friends about when they got back to the mainland. Because of the relaxed announcements, many of them thought that they would just be fine. On phone calls with their families, a lot of parents told their children to listen to their teachers or to the captain. However, the students who didn't listen to the captain left their cabins and jumped from the ship were the first to be rescued and survive. The captain's orders that day were what doomed the people inside the ferry. The last text message sent by someone aboard the ferry that day was at 10.17 a.m. as the ferry began to slowly fill with water. It read, They told us to wait. There has been no announcement since. Cho, the student who made the first emergency services call, unfortunately didn't survive and was later found drowned inside his cabin. The actions he took that day saved the lives of many, and he will be remembered as a hero. This was probably one of the most preventable tragedies in recent Korean history, and it's absolutely heartbreaking to see the footage that the students left behind. I'm scared. Really, what can I do? I'm scared. I really want to live. I'm wearing a life vest. I'd better leave a message before I die. I am recording. It's a video clip. If only I could survive. Mom and Dad, I love you. While the ferry was sinking, the government's announcements about the incident were often inaccurate or just completely false. After the ship's submergence at 11.30 a.m., a ship salvage unit was sent with scuba divers to help rescue passengers trapped inside the sinking ferry. However... At that same moment, the government announced on media news sources that all of the students aboard had been rescued safely, despite the fact that almost none of them actually had. The media reported this message, knowing that it was untrue. The police department went on live national television and said that 368 people had been rescued from the ship. However, people at the scene of the incident reported that 295 people were still missing. However, at this time, 22 out of the 29 crew had been rescued, including those responsible for the capsizing. Private companies began offering their scuba services to help rescue people trapped inside the ferry alongside civilians. They were allowed to help alongside the Coast Guard, while the Navy, who offered their services, were denied entry to the area. However, around 2 p.m. that day, the waters began to become choppy and the weather took a turn for the worse. They had to end 
end their rescue operations for the day. Two days later, on April 18th, the Coast Guard decided to pump air into the ship to support possible air pockets, but their efforts were deemed a failure. During the efforts of the subsequent days, two divers died in the attempts to rescue people aboard the ferry, and a firefighting helicopter returning from the scene crashed, killing five officers aboard and injuring the high school student. We're going to backtrack a little bit to the statement that police made on live national television that 368 people had been safely rescued from the ship. It would actually take months for everyone on the ship to be accounted for. By July 22nd, 2014, 304 people aboard the ship would be confirmed dead. Of the 476 passengers, only 172 people would be rescued from the ship. So what actually caused the Sewol Ferry to capsize? Was it actually just bad turning maneuvers? The Coast Guard did determine that the sudden unreasonable turns did cause the ship to capsize, but so did the overloading cargo. Three times the ship's limit caused the ship to to begin to tilt. A ship of this size also was required to have ballast water, which is water that is held within the ship to keep its balance when cargo is moving around. It helps the ship stay upright. While on this day, the ship was only holding a third of the ballast water that it was required to have for the weight it was holding. Well, it turns out that the safety training of the crew had been falsified anyways. The budget for their safety training was about $2, enough for them to print out the fake paper certificates. The victim's families called for President Park to answer for the horrible handling that she had of the incident. The victim's families and the survivors began to protest to have President Park impeached or for her to resign. The parents Parents and citizens of the nation were mourning, and it was an incredibly emotional time for everyone. The protests continued for five months, demanding that the government answer for their inadequacies. Park and Hye would be impeached three years following the Sewol incidents for blacklisting, corruption, and misuse of power. After her impeachment in 2017, the Sewol ferry salvage operations began, and the ship was returned to land. Families gathered to witness the ship's entirety being brought to shore. However, they were stuck behind a fence. The families demanded answers as both police, Coast Guard, and parents cried at the emotional sight of the ship being brought to land. While searching the ship, investigators found over 100 phones, many of which were able to be returned to the families. The overwhelming emotional impact of the ship being brought back to land was too much for some people, and unfortunately, some of the volunteer divers who helped rescue students and passengers that day had taken their own lives. Spoiler warning, when discussing the Netflix series All of Us Are Dead, I will be discussing details of the ship. Show, of course. If you've seen the webtoon turned Netflix series All of Us Are Dead, then you understand the feelings of desperation that these Korean high schoolers had learning that the adults and government had abandoned them. Korea's culture of obedience is shown throughout the show alongside a multitude of problems facing Korea's youth, including harassment, bullying, sexual assault, teenage pregnancy, and the increasingly tense pressure placed upon teenage shoulders. As all of the students are dealing with these problems, they turn to the government and their teachers to help them in their time of need, and all of them let them down. They either selfishly abandon the high school students or, like the science teacher, similar to our helmsman, overcorrect a problem leading to a disaster. The connections between the show and the Sewol Ferry incident are by no means far-fetched, and sometimes they're blatantly obvious. Yes. Following the Sewol tragedy, yellow ribbons with victims' names were seen everywhere, similar to the wall of ribbons featured in the show. A heartbreakingly morbid trend arose on Korean TikTok as viewers conjoined videos of the All of Us Are Dead cast members making video calls alongside the final moments of the Sewol tragedy victims. 
People have also compared the relaxed nature of the high school students at the beginning of the Netflix series to that of the high school students trapped aboard the ship when receiving announcements to stay put. Before we conclude this heartbreaking case, of course, I'd like to bring in the controversial heretical religious organization that the owner of the Sewol Ferry was the leader of. The owner of the Sewol Ferry, Yu Byung Un, was the leader of a recognized cult religious organization known as the Salvation Sect. The Sewol Ferry acted as a financial foundation for Mr. Yu to fund his own personal wealth. Not only was he collecting tithing from his church members, but he was also taking out loans using the church's real estate as collateral. And as we will learn, he was also cutting corners when it came to the Sewol Ferry's safety. Mr. Yu's cult, the Salvation Sector, had more than 200,000 members in Korea, over 100 churches, and followed event evangelical Baptist teachings, but the religion was mostly used to fund his multi-level marketing schemes. Da Panda was their most successful company with over 60 branches across Korea. They sold various things like cosmetics and health food. With all of this income, you think Mr. Yu would be able to upkeep his marine vessels, but no, instead he actually began to cut corners, leading to the falsified documents that the Sewol Ferry had. Mr. Yu's son, actually was spending time in prison for embezzling 6.8 million U.S. dollars from the companies that they owned. Mr. Yu was ordered to pay 46 million U.S. dollars in damages to the government, but he wasn't found guilty in any involvement related to the sinking of the Sewol Ferry. While I believe that Mr. Yu's greed and his actions were directly responsible for the sinking of the Sewol Ferry, the courts disagreed. However, Captain Lee was charged life in prison for negligence, but not for murder. The families were furious with his outcome considering he did abandon the ship before any of the students were rescued. Captain Lee failed to have and execute an evacuation plan that day, leading to the death of 304 people. 14 of the crew members were given lighter sentences for negligence. I'm leaving you today with a quote by Kim Guan Hung, one of the civilian divers who took his own life following the painful memories of retrieving bodies from the ferry. I want to question the high-ranking officials. I remember everything with acute pain. I cannot forget. But how come you, the elites of society, claim that you don't know and you don't remember? Thank you for listening to Korean True Crime with me, your host, Mimi Mizuko. See you next time.